Hi everyone, welcome to Meridian Steps to Wellness, the self-care edition. Sorry we're a couple minutes late. You know what they say, to err is human, but to really mess it up takes a computer. So we had a little bit of uh, technical issues, but we're here now and we're happy to have you here today. We are gonna start off today with just a few poll questions um, and we want you to participate in it answer the questions um, and we'll get the answers back and then I'll let you know what the right answer is. So we're gonna be sending out the first poll question to you right now. And we'll just give you about a uh, few seconds or so to take a look at that. So it's what percentage of the population is experiencing a mental health disorder at any given time? Okay, I see the answers coming in. Ah, and it looks like most of you know the correct answer. <laughs> Are we still going? Okay. Okay, we're gonna end the poll now. So, well that answer is coming up. Did you put the poll answer out? Or the uh, data, okay, that's the data. Okay, well the correct answer is 18.5. So at any given time, 18.5% of the population is experiencing a mental health disorder. So, you know, just think about that and how you probably know a number of people that are struggling, even if you don't know that they're struggling. So we're gonna go ahead and put the second question out now. And the second one is the average length of time someone waits to get professional help from the time they first begin experiencing symptoms. What do you think on that? Look, you guys, you know, you know all the answers. I don't know, is everybody a clinician on this call today? All right, we're about to end that poll and the answer for that is 10 years. Could you imagine struggling for 10 years? There are a lot of different reasons for that. Sometimes with a mental illness, you don't even, you're not aware that you're having one. Um, and sometimes we just think we're having a rough time and it's persisting. Um, and there are just uh, so many different reasons for it, but that average time is 10 years. Okay, we're gonna go with poll question number three now. So how many telehealth visits do you think that Meridian conducted in 2020? Look at you guys again. That is awesome. We'll just go another second or so here. All right. So the answer on that one is 31,047. And it's more than doubled that in 2021. Okay, ready for number four? So which is the most common mental health disorder? You got anxiety, depression, substance misuse. Okay, you're gonna go on that one and we have the correct answer is anxiety. All right, on to number five. Which is the most commonly misused substance? I don't know, we'll have to ask some of the clinicians if uh, a glass of wine after work is a misuse or not. Okay, here we go. Look like you guys all got that one, that's alcohol. <laughs> So how much did Meridian provide? And I say how much did Meridian provide, but it's really the community's investment. It's the philanthropists in the community. It's uh, you know our partnerships with the um, counties and funding and grant and everybody. So what was the community's investment in uncompensated care in 2020? Yep, and it looks like you guys are all hitting on that. It's over half a million dollars. You guys are too good at this. Okay, so on to number seven. What happened to people's access to treatment at Meridian during the pandemic? 
Did it increase? Did it decrease? Did it stay about the same? You are again, you guys are brilliant. You are again correct because it increased due to targeted efforts to meet the rising demand, transition to telehealth. Um, and over time, people's issues complicated due to isolation um, and you know being away from people. So people struggled a lot more, they lost jobs. And so we increased access and more people needed help. Okay, let's go with number eight now. Which of these is a warning sign that someone might be experiencing thoughts of suicide? Yep, you're right again, giving away valued possessions. Okay, now the next one. How many co-responders teams does Meridian currently have in partnership with local law enforcement? We do, we have four plus one in the works. We'll soon to have five co-responder teams and that makes a great impact on uh, the community uh, resources and just being help, helping people to get into treatment when they need treatment. All right, so what do we have here now? Who can take Meridian's mental health first aid class? Yep. Every single person got that, everyone and anyone. <laughs> okay, we are on number 11. So which event nearly doubles a person's chances of seeking help for mental health or substance misuse disorders? Yeah, we got some split answers on this, as you, you might imagine, but it's someone close suggests it to them. You know, it's just peer relationships, family, connection, people they trust. If they trust you, they're more likely to listen. So what are some things that early intervention can help with? That's number 12. Got better long-term functioning, reduce risk. Yep, yeah, there you go. So it looks like everybody selected all the different answers and that was a trick question because all of the answers were correct. So you're all right on that one. Now we're gonna go to number 13 here. What happens if someone doesn't have a digital device or enough data to participate in telehealth at Meridian? You got it. Those that qualify can receive a device and the necessary data from Meridian. And that program was kick-started early on in the pandemic when um, very philanthropic board member of ours um, made a major gift contribution um, that we were also able to take and use to secure some other funding and we were able to launch that program. All right, so in 2020, what percentage of clients were children? And this is actually true for most years. Yep, 26%. So can stress, if left, left unaddressed, can that turn into something else? Can it become depression or anxiety? Can it lead to other mental health issues? You are correct once again, it can. You guys are a really uh, brilliant group out there. I think you got everything, everything correct. I appreciate you taking the time to participate in those poll questions. We thought it would be a fun and engaging thing to do and also help us all learn a little bit more um, about mental health and substance use disorders. So I think I hopped right in and didn't introduce myself, which I often do because I'm, you know, 
the center of the universe, so I think everybody knows who I am. But I'm Joy Riddle. Um, I am a senior vice president here at Meridian, and I'm really happy to have all of you here with us today. We were so excited that so many of you uh, joined, even though we had to transition to being 100% uh, digital at this point due to the peak in the uh, pandemic in our local area. So thank you again for joining us. And I just wanted to say, if you have any questions today, you can drop those in the chat. I don't know that we'll have time to answer them live today, but we will definitely get back with you if you have any questions that are in the chat. We'll reach back out to you after the event. And you can always contact any of our staff members at here at Meridian. We're always happy to help you. So I just wanted to take a minute today to do something a little bit different because uh, nobody ever introduces the MC. The MC just comes up and takes over. But I did want to recognize our guest MC um, who volunteers to help us every year with this event. And it's David Snyder. And he's the co-anchor at WCJB for 5, 6, and 11 PM newscast. He's originally from Detroit. So although he cheers for Red Wings, Tigers, Lions, and the Pistons, he's raising his children as proud Florida Gators So, when it, when it comes to college ball. So he asks if we could just give him a little bit of grace there and cut him some slack since uh, he's not liking all of our teams. But with all kidding aside, Dave, Dave is a serious journal, journalist with wide-ranging experience. He's been broadcasting for... Uh, over 30 years now, and he's really done some amazing and serious reporting. You know, he covered Congress on September 11th, and then the next day he witnessed, and I, when I saw this in his bio, I got goosebumps and I just got him again because, oh, I would have given anything to experience this. But the day after, on September 12th, he witnessed firsthand the stirring and defiant image of the law makers when they all got together and they were united and they sang God Bless America on the front of the Capitol, at the front of the Capitol building. That was uh, a really momentous day that stressed a lot of our mental health, probably all of us. Um, and that was such an amazing sight. So I'm really jealous. But there's a couple of other things about David. He was catapulted off an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. So I'm going to have to learn more about that later on. <laughs> You're going to have to tell me that story. But he also prayed with Moses. Now, it might not be the Moses that you're thinking of or that I'm thinking of, but it was Charlton Heston when he played Moses. So he is now privileged. He thinks he's privileged to be here in north central Florida, and we're privileged to have him. Um, he says that one of his most memorable moments covering North Central Florida news was the hurricane season of 2004. I remember that one very clearly, too, because I was running a residential emergency shelter for at-risk and homeless youth during that year, so that was quite, quite trying. So, but I do understand that he still has a water bottle rain gauge and a wind gauge necktie um, from that time. I'm going to need to see that too, Dave. Dave, thank you so much for all of your support of the community in North Central Florida, and you're very philanthropic in everything you do, and we really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Here is David Snyder. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, I'm, am I too tall for this shot, or am I, uh, do I need to do this? <laughs> Oh, there we are. Hey, everybody. I'm sorry we can't be together in person, um, but, uh, you know, at least we have the technology of today to be able to gather together in this way, too, and to, to support Meridian, and I'm certainly glad to be able to do so. You know, it's always intimidating for someone like me to be in a room full of clinicians and professionals who I, I imagine are constantly looking at me and, and trying to diagnose me. You know, what is wrong with this guy, basically? So... You know, coping with all the things in the news that we do as journalists, um, and we all do it differently. We all cope differently um, because, you know, the constant stream of bad news that we've had to deal with for the past few years, it, it does take a mental toll on those who are, you know, trying to at least convey the news to people. Um, and so we all cope differently. And, and one way that I cope is just through humor. And, you know, forgive me in advance because a lot of it is is pretty bad, but uh, I 
uh, kind of a professional dad joke guy. So, you know, you're going to get some of that from me. And uh, we also do news headlines, of course, all the time. And here's, here's, here's bringing you a news headline from this morning. The World Health Organization announced today that dogs cannot carry COVID-19. And so any dog that's in quarantine is released. So in other words, who let the dogs out? I'm coping, I'm coping, help me here. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you again to Meridian's fifth annual Steps to Wellness event, the self-care edition, of course, taking place virtually from Meridian's main campus. And I just learned where it is because I got lost finding the place, but here we are. September is Recovery Month. National Recovery Month is a national observance held every September to promote and support new evidence-based treatment and recovery practices, the emergence of a strong and proud recovery community, and the dedication of service providers and community members across the nation who make recovery in all its forms possible. And as, a, and as, as an aside, the recovery community, you people are amazing. You're strong, I'm impressed, it's, and it's okay. Everybody has had their thing, their stuff, and I'm, I'm one of them. We all are. And so there's no shame in, in being part of the recovery community. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of you and, uh, and just glad to be counted among you. So continuing with my script here, though, Recovery Month is the reason that Steps to Wellness takes place every September. Meridian has helped thousands of people here in North Central Florida reach recovery, and it's one of the reasons I'm honored, truly honored, to support Meridian and be tonight's, today's guest MC. I work nights. I don't know what it today is. I mean, what is morning? Somebody said the sun also rises. I, I, I don't know anything about that. I'd also like to thank you for supporting this event and Meridian's mission to promote the health, recovery, and well-being of those affected by mental illness and substance abuse disorders through prevention, coordinated treatment, and supportive services. We have a number of sponsors we want to thank today. We're going to take a moment to acknowledge there are many sponsors who are making this event possible, including our Platinum Sponsors, Assured Partners, and Florida Insurance Trust. Our Gold Sponsors, Maggie Labarda and John Cherry, Florida Food Service, Datus, part of the Continuum Cloud, and Genoa, Genoa Pharmacy. And we want to thank you to all our silver and bronze supporters and all of you who have joined us here today. Now, don't forget, we've got this auction going on. It's pretty darn awesome. You've got to go online to www.32auctions.com forward slash Meridian Cares. That's 32auctions.com forward slash Meridian Cares to grab some great silent auction items and support client services here at Meridian. I'd like to now introduce to you in our program, Laura Hawley. She's Meridian's Prevention Director, been working to support children and families for almost 17 years in various capacities. She's a subject matter expert on stress management and was a master resilience trainer when working for the United States Army. Thank you for your service. She holds a master's degree in counseling from Liberty University and is a certified facilitator of more than a dozen curriculums supporting pr prevention events in the areas of mental health, substance abuse, suicide, and child victimization. Please welcome Laura Hawley. Thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate that, and thank you for being here. I'm so excited to be here, uh, and I'm particularly excited because of our topic this year being self-care. Uh, it's a topic that I'm very passionate about, um, and I've spoken a lot on, especially over the past 18 months. Um, self-care for a lot of us has and, um, and is has been uh, very reactive, right? So we walk through a difficult situation or we experience a stressor, it sort of triggers an awareness in us that we need to do something to take care of ourselves, and then, and then we do it, right? We've, we've walked through, we practice our self-care, we rest, and we recover. Um, and then the crisis ends, and, that, and, and the problem being that 18 months ago, that might have worked really well, right? Um, and it doesn't anymore because things are different, and this is how they're different. The pandemic crisis didn't end. Uh, our brains and our bodies are built for survival. So when we experience a crisis uh, or something happens at the beginning of the pandemic, our brains release 
adrenaline and all of these chemicals and all these great things our bodies respond to get us through a crisis. We have fight or flight, um, and and we we handle it. Uh, that's why after a crisis, often we say we marvel at ourselves and we say, "Gosh, I handled things I, I never thought I could handle," or "I I." I survived, I did things I didn't think I could do, and we're depleted and we're tired and we recover. That didn't happen in the pandemic. Um, we, we hit it in the beginning, um, we worked through everything, and then the pandemic persisted. Uh, and when the pandemic persisted, all of the great stuff that our brains and our bodies gave us, it ran out. It ran out and the crisis continued. So it stands to reason that if the crisis changed, our self-care has to change too, right? If we're looking at a pandemic that looks like a lifestyle, then self-care has to be a lifestyle too. So what does a lifestyle of self-care look like, right? Well, it looks like a couple of things. It looks like it looks like more than long walks and bubble baths. I mean, I, I want you to do those things too. Those things are great. Keep doing that. Um, but it looks like knowing your limits, knowing what you can and can't do, um, and operating in a place that uh, is healthy for you. It looks like having boundaries and enforcing them, whether that's with people or tasks um, or, or, again, back to your own limits. It looks a lot like knowing how to say no, uh, knowing how to reduce your workload, how and when, um, and reducing self-imposed pressure. That's markers of a lifestyle of self-care. It also looks like taking care of our physical bodies. Uh, physical health and mental health are very connected. Um, so a lifestyle of self-care looks like paying attention to those things, whether that's getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, taking your vitamins, keeping your doctor's appointments, or uh, getting enough exercise or movement in your every day. Um, this is a topic we talked about very recently um, when, we, um, uh, when we recorded our, our new podcast, The Brain Factor. We have a whole episode with a special guest on everyday movement and how that's connected to our mental health. Um, a lifestyle of self-care also looks like identifying your resources, right? So we wanna identify our people resources. Who are those people in your life that we can stay connected to, right? Who are the people that we can talk to? Um, who, what's our community that we belong to and the communities within our community? That's hard when you're going through periods of isolation, but as we're proving today by still congregating for this, it's not impossible. And we've learned a lot over the past 18 months about how to do that, right? A lifestyle of self-care is very proactive. Um, it's not responding to a stressor. It's putting things in place for you that are protective so that you don't have that burnout, right? So if we pay attention and we listen to our bodies, and you guys are in for a big treat in a little bit because um, we've got some guests that are going to teach us more about how to listen and respond to what our bodies are telling us. Um, if we pay attention to our bodies and we pay attention to the environment around us, um, and we identify the people that make up our circle and our village, we're setting ourselves up for much more success um, in when it comes to having a lifestyle of self-care. Again, still do the long walks and the bubble baths and all of those things. Ask yourself every day, ask yourself every day, what am I going to do today to take care of me? And sometimes that answer could be, you know what? I am going to hit the ground running at work. I'm going to knock out that entire to-do list. I'm going to work, you know, more hours than I need to because I'm stressed out that I have so much to do and, I, and I'm going to reduce my workload that way, right? So it may be being a rock star one day. And some days your answer might be, you know what? I'm going to do the necessary things and I'm going to take some me time or I'm going to take some time off or I'm going to take a nap, right? Whatever that answer is for you that day, that's okay. But ask yourself that question every day. What am I going to do on purpose today to take care of myself? Not just in response to an immediate stressor that's in front of me, but how am I going to incorporate that? My challenge to you today to start building a lifestyle of self-care is to do three things. To identify, number one, three activities that amp you up and bring you joy. What are the three things that you do that bring you joy, right? Um, that give you energy, that amp you up, right? 
Number two, identify three things that calm you down. What are three activities or three things that you do that bring you peace and calm you down? And then the last thing is to identify three people. Um, and write this stuff down, right? Write this stuff down, tuck it away somewhere. What are the three people that you can process feelings with, that you can talk to, that you can share things with? That's important, okay? Um, what happens if you look at those categories and you don't have three in one? That's okay. That's a great place to start, to start building a lifestyle of self-care, right? Maybe we have two activities that amp us up, one activity that calms us down, and we can only come up with one person. Okay, let's start building those categories. Let's start exploring what we enjoy doing, how it makes us feel. Start building some relationships that we have that maybe need a little more attention, right? So start looking at those categories of your life. That's a great place to start. And never forget that the most important room in any room you walk into is you. I'm sorry, the most important person in any room that you walk into is you. Our CEO, Don Savoy, who can't be with us today, once said in a meeting, um, he equated self-care to being on an airplane and having the oxygen masks drop. Uh, and we're always told, put it on your own face first, right? Um, you're no good to help anybody else if you don't help you first. So that's my challenge to you today. Come up with those lists um, and take care of you. Ask yourself every day. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to uh, turn it back to Dave now. Thank you so much. Larry. Such words of wisdom right there. And I'm, I'm so glad to be able to say that uh, I have uh, at least one person that I know that I can talk to about anything, and uh, and that's such a relief to be able to uh, unburden yourself. And you know, long walks and bubble baths are great too. I mean, I, you know, I love the bubble baths, but my neighbor hates it when I use his pool that way. Okay, so moving on with our program today, we're going to introduce our next guest speaker. It's David Cranson. He's a licensed mental health counselor and certified addiction professional. He's the clinical director at Meridian, serving the Tri-County area. David specializes in addiction, anger management, anxiety, depression, marriage, and couples counseling. That's quite a lot. He's been serving the clients of Meridian for more than 10 years now. We're welcoming to our stage, David Cranson. Uh, thank you for that warm welcome. And uh, so, yeah, my name is Dave. I'm a director here at Meridian Behavioral Healthcare, and I'm going to talk a little bit about mindfulness and its application to daily living. So we find that mindfulness is a great way to take care of ourselves. Uh, mindfulness can be viewed as moment by moment awareness to what is actually occurring using our senses and sensations. No longer do we have to wait for the light at the end of the tunnel. With mindfulness, we're able to bring that light to us here and now. It is not about getting from point A to point B, but rather the experience of the journey. As we focus on the here and now, we begin to take care of ourselves and allow ourselves to have new experiences. Many people deal with stress and unwanted feelings due to their thought process. And these thought processes can be almost viewed as time travel. So we may flash back to the past, things that have been done to us or things that we have done um, we may time travel to the future and have worries about things that may not even occur or worries about the unknown. And with these types of thinking, we, we kind of get stuck. We are physically present, but mentally we are miles away. Our mind tends to drift, become bored, we uh, push away or wish things were different than they are. And the funny thing is, is that the more that we push away from these 
feelings and thoughts or uh, things that we, we don't want in our life, we end up focusing more on them. And so the, th the same thing goes for experiences that we find pleasurable. And with that, we tend to latch on to it and we don't want to let go of those experiences. And so uh, when we're looking at that, it kind of keeps us stuck. We're not able to move forward to the next event or the next uh, positive experience or whether it's a positive or negative, it's just living and not existing. And so uh, as we look into the use of mindfulness, we can kind of break these habits and we can almost get off of that hamster wheel of unwanted or unhealthy thoughts. And when we're able to do this, we're able to bring ourselves back to the, to the present moment and find out that everything is okay. And we find out that every experience, including what I'm doing right now is new and what I'm doing right now is new and what I'm doing right now is new. And so this is where we begin to live and not exist. So one of the ways that I believe mindfulness can really help us out is if we're able to focus on the process of the activity or our actions rather than the outcome. And so as we focus on the process rather than the outcome, we find that we are able to live and we're able to be more present, we're able to be here and now, and we're able to find that everything is okay and everything is a new experience. And so um, zeroing in on these activities, zeroing in on what's around us, zeroing in on what we're feeling allows us to take that journey. So one activity that I really like investing in, and it seems to keep me grounded, is called the Mindfulness Body Scan Meditation. Um, my colleague and uh, an amazing counselor, Megan Flanagan, is going to walk us through the Mindfulness Body Scan Meditation. Um, so I think you guys are in for a treat. And uh, I hope all of you are able to stay in the present moment and uh, just live. Experience good, bad, boring, let go and continue to take care of yourself. We only get this one life, so live it and share that good energy with other people as well. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Megan, and thank you for the welcome and for having me here today. Today, I want to invite all of you to join with me on a body scan experience. And this body scan experience is just one way of incorporating the mindfulness concepts that David just mentioned to us. Through this experience, we connect with ourselves, we connect with our bodies, it helps us to know what we need in that moment in general and helps us to know ourselves. So by taking a few minutes today and participating in this experience, it'll be one way of taking a step towards wellness, which is what today's event is about. So let's go ahead and get started by getting comfortable in your seats. I'm gonna focus on the weight of the body and the seat, your feet against the ground, and your hands in your lap or at your sides. 
And let's direct a soft gaze forward, not focusing on anything in particular, just connecting with the environment that you're in, grounding yourself in the here and now. You may notice sounds around you, and that is okay. You can focus on those sounds as well, bringing yourself more into your environment. And then we're going to go ahead and take three deep breaths together. So we're gonna to inhale together through the nose and exhale through the mouth or nose. Again, inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth or nose. And then one last time together, we're going to inhale through the nose. And as you exhale, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes. Directing our attention inward. And now let's bring our attention to our feet. Feeling the feet against the ground or your socks or shoes. Noticing any sensations in the feet, tingling, temperature, pressure. We'll scan up into the ankles, the calves, shins, up to the thighs. And whatever you're experiencing right now, is okay. Allow yourself to experience your experience. Just let it be your experience. And now let's allow the legs and the feet to dissolve in the mind's eye as we shift our attention upward into the lower back. And then scanning to the mid back and scanning into the upper back becoming curious about our experience. If your mind wanders, that is okay. That is what minds do. Simply notice this, congratulate yourself for noticing this, and redirect your attention to your breath as an anchor or to the feelings you're experiencing in your back. Now let's move our attention gently into the stomach region. You may notice movement in the stomach, rise and fall. If you don't notice, you might place your hand on your stomach to connect with that. You may notice the process of digestion and let go of any judgments or stories you're telling yourself about this area. Notice how all sensations, they rise, they fall, they shift and change from moment to moment. This is the concept of impermanence that we can apply to our lives, daily lives. And now let's scan up into the chest region. You may also notice movement in the chest. And again, you can place your hand here if it helps you connect. And for just a moment, let's focus on your heartbeat. And now let's go ahead and scan up to the shoulders, a place that we often hold tension. On the next breath, allow that tension to roll off of your shoulders. We'll scan up now into the neck. Notice any tension here. Let's also, let's redirect our attention now to our hands. See if you can channel your breathing into your hands, almost as if you are breathing into and out from the hands. We'll scan up into the arms. You may notice one arm feels differently than the other arm and that is okay. And then let's move our attention to our face. We 
You may notice movement of the face or any sensations here. And then up into the head region, focusing on the head, top of the head. And if you can, see if you can imagine you're putting your attention about an inch or so above the head. And now let's expand our awareness to connecting the body as a whole from head to toe or from toe to head. Noticing how everything is connected, everything works together, and bringing a sense of gratitude to our bodies and to what they do for us. And when you're ready, if you've closed your eyes, you can open them and return to this event. <laughs> And this is a practice that I really love. I, I use this for myself and I use this with my clients as well. It's something that you can shorten into a minute, a minute to three minutes. It's something that you could extend to 15, 30, 45 minutes, whatever works best for you um, to just really incorporate this into your daily self-care, into your emotional hygiene, to take a step toward wellness. Something you can do daily, it's something you can do weekly, it's something you can do as needed um, for prevention, whatever. So I, what comes to mind when I think about this um, with my clients, I have one client who, his name is John, and John, he uses this three times a day. He uses this in the morning to start his day. He uses this at lunch or at his break at work. And then he also uses this at night to help him fall asleep. And you don't have to be like John, you don't have to use it this much, but for him, it really helps him to feel more comfortable with transitions, to feel more comfortable with change, to decrease his anxiety overall. So I think this is something that's great for us to use. Simple, but effective. Thank you for having me here today and for participating. Thank you so much, Megan. Appreciate it. <sighs> really relax now. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> After that, let's uh, let's talk a little about Megan. Uh, we we want to introduce her to you as well. She's uh, she has a dual master's degree and education specialist degree in clinical mental health counseling from Florida State University. She's a registered mental health counseling intern and national certified counselor. She's an outpatient clinician at Meridian Behavioral Healthcare, who runs the intensive outpatient program specializing in substance abuse treatment. She's certified in applied suicide intervention skills training and specializes in addiction, anxiety, depression, anger, and trauma. Thank you so much for that presentation, Megan. You know, as a reporter, um, we deal with uh, lots, of, um, lots of bad news. And, uh, and there are a lot of human stories that we have to tell. And as a reporter, as a field, you know, in the field uh, for many years before I became an anchor at TV20, um, every day was something new that we had to cover. Um, and every day was potentially a day that we would have to run into human tragedy and suffering and sadness, um, whether it be refugee camps in uh, Kosovo or the murder of a child in Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, every day as a reporter, you, you don't know what you're going to come across. And yet you still have to report what's happened even after talking to a, a grieving mother about what's happened to their child. Uh, I tell young reporters that you kind of have to flip a switch at the beginning of the day to turn off your emotions. Um, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to remember to flip that switch back. And you're going to have to experience those emotions, those feelings, that trauma, and work your way through it um, if, if, you're going to be, if you're going to be whole, if you're going to be sane. You, you've got to be a human being at least part of the time as a journalist. Uh, once again, we'd like to welcome back Laura Holly to the stage here for our next part of the program.
Wow, I I'm also very relaxed now. I've you know I've heard Megan do that a couple of times, and uh, each time uh, I get something new out of it, I feel something different or experience something new. So I, I think that's kind of a neat part about any self exploration or taking time to listen. You know, when we come to the table to walk through exercises like that, you know, where I was, and this speaks to. to Dave Cranston's point to where I was yesterday or an hour ago isn't where I am right now. And so my experience with that might be different, right? And it might serve a different purpose for me in that moment. And so so I love um, revisiting tools like that often uh, because our results are different. And I, and I love that. Uh, I'm saying the word tools, right? So we hear that imagery um, a lot when we talk about life skills and coping skills. We hear tools in a toolbox, right? We, we've heard that before, we use that. Um, and I wanna speak to that for a minute because I think it's important to know that you can't have enough tools. There's no such thing as being all filled up in your toolbox when it comes to resiliency or coping skills or self-care or stress management or any of that. Um, you know, you need a whole tool chest for just some of those individual topics, right? So when we think about the imagery of a toolbox, think about if you were gonna hang a picture on a wall, right? And you opened your toolbox and your hammer was missing. Maybe you're like me and you have a middle schooler and they didn't put it back, shocker, right? Uh, so, so the hammer's missing. Are you gonna be able to hang the picture on the wall? Sure. Right? I'm going to use the back of the screwdriver or the wrench or my shoe or whatever I have next to me, um, and I'm going to get the picture hung on the wall. Right, But it's going to take me twice as long. I'm going to feel frustrated. I'm going to be tired. I might be angry. And there's probably three or four holes in the wall behind the picture. Right, So just because we are accomplishing the job, speaking to, to Dave's point again, just because we're surviving doesn't mean we're using the right tool for the job. So how do we know if we're using the right tool? That's the exploration that I hope uh, we all embark on. Right, Let's learn the tools. Let's um, Let's get as much in those toolbox and tool sheds that we possibly can. So if something isn't working for us, we can try something else. And when we're like Megan's client, John, and we find something that works, keep doing it. Keep doing it if it's working for you, right? If it's healthy and it's helping you and you have found the tool that works for you. But what works for you might not work for the person next to you. So we need to go out. We need to explore. We need to know who we are, what fills us up, what gives us joy, what calms us down, um, and, and go on that journey. This is a great time to do that after we've been living through this sustained crisis. It's a, it's a great time to learn about ourselves, okay? Um, Shameless plug, another place where you can get some of those tools is a, is a new podcast that uh, Meridian has um, in development right now that's getting ready to be released. And we're very proud of it. It's called The Brain Factor. It's going to be available anywhere that you get your podcasts. So look for that. We're going to see that um, in early October. Um, the introductory uh, episode will go out. And then after that, it will be every uh, third Wednesday. Um, so midweek slump, hump day look for that um, as October gets rolling. Um, what we're focusing on in that podcast is uh, protective factors um, that exist, uh, that science tells us help keep us re resilient, right? Um, and then like kind of what that means in real life. How do, we, how do we beef up those areas? If we know, as an example I mentioned earlier, if we know that um, physical movement um, and body health is a protective factor, well, what does that look like in my life? How do I do that? One of the topics that we talk about um, is optimism and toxic positivity and where that line is. Um, and that's something I'm very passionate about. So I hope that you tune in, um, maybe learn some more tools um, through that as well. Um, Dave, uh, David, I liked what you said about um, focusing on the process and not the outcome and living each moment um, that life is the series of moments. That that spoke to me because it, you, you didn't say that everything was positive and everything was good, right? So there's a range of human emotions that we go through and we get to experience all of them. So none of this, self-care, stress management, um, gratitude, and none of the tools are designed to make your problems go away or to minimize your experience if you're going through some, something negative. It's really just designed to help propel us through our lives, put us back in control. Um, 
you're capable, we all are, of navigating um, uh, what life throws at us, right? Uh, but if we're having trouble and we're getting stuck, there's also help available, right? There's help available if you find that some time has passed and you're not getting better and your self-care tools are not working. Um, there's help available. And so we want everyone to know that, that, that no matter who you are or where you are, you can reach out. Um, to get more of this type of content and this these type of resources, there's several things we have that are available to your businesses or your organizations that aren't clinical, right? That are preventative. Um, we can come and we can speak to your organization. That's a wonderful way to support Meridian. Ask us to come talk at your event or come talk um, to your staff or to your team or to your church or your civic organization. Um, and, and we can talk about whatever topic is gonna meet the needs of your community best, right? We also have uh, mental health first aid classes available um, for um, uh, for us to come out. And uh, that is, if you're not familiar, it's an eight-hour certification course designed to teach the non-clinical person how to intervene in a mental health crisis, right? So it's very much like CPR. Um, what happens if you happen upon uh, a mental health crisis and, and how do we help people? How do we bridge the gap to the next step, right? Um, so uh, so I mentioned just now uh, two ways that you can help propel Meridian's mission forward. Uh, have us come out to your organization, have us teach a class, right? Uh, another way that you can help is to purchase a silent auction item. And that that's uh, at 32auctions.com forward slash Meridian Cares. There's some great stuff up there. Um, and uh, and you want to get those bids in before that closes. Um, you can also follow us on our social media, right? And that includes that podcast, right? So subscribe to it, download it, watch it, um, give, give that a chance. I, I'm really proud of that. And I think you guys are going to enjoy that as well. Um, um, on socials, we are at MBHCI. Uh, so check us out, uh, check out our content and uh, interact with us there. We love seeing um, folks do that. Uh, another very easy way that we can support you can support us is to um, talk to each other, talk to people, tell people about Meridian services, about the importance of taking care of yourself, the importance of mental health. If you have a story, share it. That helps reduce stigma. In the very beginning, Joy talked about the fact that people wait an average of 10 years, right? Let's talk about it. Maybe we can get that number down, okay? Um, and then finally, if you'd like to make a gift um, to Meridian to help support our mission, you can do that on our website, uh, mbhci.org forward slash donate, or you can talk to any one of us um, about how uh, you can make a gift and how it can best help support our mission. So, Joy, did you want to come back up for a minute? Awesome. I'm going to bring Joy back up to, to wrap things up today. You know, as we're um, talking about self-care today and its importance and uh, everything, oh, I'm just, uh, just caught me off guard here because I see one of my best friend's name is the name that's displaying on the uh, computer right now. <laughs> so it just took me off my game for a half a second here. Anyway, as we're talking about self-care and it's important and these tools that were shared, you know, by Megan and you'll learn, you'll get a lot of different tools on the podcast that actually Laura and I are co-hosts together. Um, we spend a lot of time laughing and being goofy, but Laura mentioned the fact that, you know, sometimes you have a hammer and sometimes you have the bottom of your shoe to get a job done. Um, and the, the the tools are really important in you know coping with something or dealing with something and a little bit earlier about an hour before uh, this event was going to start i got a phone call with some you know news that i wasn't happy to hear um, that kind of took my breath away just a bit and uh, i was coming in here and getting started and going back you know through it and i thought oh Maybe I can do a body scan so I can calm down and get up there on stage. And I went, oh, wait, no, I don't have time to do a body scan really the way I think I need to do it to work. So I stopped and I did box breathing because that's very quick. And I sat over on the side out of the way for, you know, just a minute while everything was getting going and did box breathing, which is... Essentially, it's another tool to help you with stress and energy management, as we like to call it on our podcast, but uh, it's a series of um, a four count on breathing. So you would breathe 
in, and you can do this with me if you want right now, but you can breathe in a four count and then hold it for a four count and then breathe out, let everything go for a four count and then hold again for another four count. So you got your breathe in, just rest, breathe out, just rest again, four by four by four by four, which makes it box breathing. Um, and of course, I didn't create that tool because I'm not a tool creator. <laughs> anyway, I did just want to share that with you um, today. We did start, um, we added some extra time into this presentation because it's the first time that we were doing something like this um, in this format, fully virtual. So we ended up with a little extra time at the end. Um, so we are gonna wrap up a little bit early today, but I did just wanna take an opportunity um, to thank you all again for coming. I wanna see if I could possibly get Megan to come back up here and do another exercise, a different, a mindful something. Looks like she's considering it. I think I might be able to get her back up here. She's coming. <laughs> that was a complete surprise for her. So she's probably whipping out whatever her tool is right now to go, huh, <laughs> how do I, what am I gonna do to Joy when I get up there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but she just told me about some really neat techniques she did at a presentation that she did the other day for our local chapter of uh, Florida Public Relations Association. Hello again. Um, so yeah, I have a number of different exercises that are, are really great. Um, the other, at the last chapter meeting it was, we did a safe place visualization, which is where you create a safe place in your mind, utilizing some different senses. Um, we also did a mindful eating exercise where you have like a piece of gum or candy or whatever and you really focus on the process of chewing or eating the item. We also did a mindful walk which is where you really focus on your body um, and the movements of your body and even your environment, you know, if you're enjoying a walk outdoors and whatnot. Um, for the sake of time and for just kind of to make it easier since I don't know if everybody has food on them or could move around and the safe place visualization is a little bit longer. Um, I'll, I'll share with you a, another breathing exercise. So it's not the box breathing. I love the box breathing. I do that one myself as well. But another one that I do, and I did it so much that it's now um, my natural breathing um, exercise, <laughs> is diaphragmatic breathing. So diaphragmatic breathing is where you're breathing from your diaphragm instead of your chest. If you were to place one hand on your chest right now and another hand on your diaphragm, and just take a couple normal breaths, see which, which body part moves. Is your belly moving? Is your chest moving? Are they both moving? If your belly's moving, you're naturally a diaphragm breather. If your chest is moving, then you're a chest breather. If both are moving, you're also considered a chest breather. So when we breathe through our chest, this is actually an anxious response that we've developed over time. When we were babies, infants, our bellies were moving. If you look at a baby breathing, you'll see their bellies are moving. Um, so to kind of get ourselves back to that, we can practice intentionally breathing through the diaphragm. So there's a couple ways to make this easy, easier. Um, one is if you're sitting at a chair, you could kind of reach your arms behind to open up a little bit. You could also put your hands behind your head to open up a little bit. Or you could really just focus on intentionally moving the belly with the breath. So when we inhale, we'll feel the belly expand. Then we exhale, we'll feel the belly contract. And if you do this every day, it becomes your new way of, of breathing, pretty much. It can take some time, but uh, you can wire yourself to be able to do this without even thinking about it, which I have found that I have actually done. 
Um, now I get more out of it when I intentionally like take some deep breaths and focus by incorporating it into my breathing um, exercise, emotional hygiene. But I do think this is a really great tool that we can do anytime. You know, you could be working, you could be eating, you could be doing whatever. You don't have to set time aside to practice breathing. So some people, maybe they might notice, who knows, but it, you're, it's about focusing on you and what you need. So I hope this helps. Um, just a simple exercise for all of you. And thank you for having me come back up. Thank you, man. Yep. Appreciate it. With all these breathing exercises, it feels like a big Lamaze class <laughs> around here. Anyways, uh, so I wanted to uh, uh, come back and thank our sponsors once again. Uh, let's give them one more shout out here. Um, all the sponsors contributed to the event, including the Platinum Sponsors, Assured Partners, and Florida Insurance Trust. Our gold sponsor, Maggie Labarda and John Cherry, Florida Food Service, Datus, part of the Continuum Cloud, and Genoa Pharmacy. They're the folks and the organizations that are helping make this possible today. Um, you know, we all have, uh, since this is virtual, it's, it's part of the pandemic story, right? And we all have our pandemic stories. Uh, we all have our experiences. You remember back in the day, uh, there was the run on toilet paper. Hope everybody's passed that by now. We, uh, we ended up having to use lettuce. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Tomorrow, well, that remains to be seen. <laughs> Who knows? Anyhow, folks, if you want to have a last few words here, uh, it's been a joy to be back together, at least virtually, and, uh, and to talk about mental health because it is... Uh, hopefully, I think, becoming uh, understood to be deeply important and as important as our physical health. Um, at least that's the way I see it. And, and it's all connected anyways, right? And, uh, and, and for me as well, spiritual health is a part of my mental health as well. So uh, that's an important component, I think, as well. But anyhow, folks, uh, thank you for having me. Um, do you want to finish up with a few words? And uh, Okay, and again, thank you for having me here. It's been a pleasure. And uh, look forward to seeing you all in person, hopefully next year. I just, uh, I'll just thank all of our, our sponsors again. Thank you so much. And for our attendees and for all of you for always supporting and being a part of Meridian. I know a lot of our sponsors are on this call today as I've seen everybody's names coming through. And I think we had over 100 people or so on this virtual event. Um, and I know oftentimes when things go virtual, the uh, people drop off, but you guys are... Um, you guys are stellar and you stick with us and we really appreciate that and our community appreciates you. So I am not going to uh, belabor this, but I wanted just to thank you one more time and then I'm going to let you guys get back to your day. I hope you guys uh, were able to utilize your Uber gift card code to get something to eat today. Uh, we really appreciate you and I really hope we're in person next year. <laughs> So you have a great day and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>